Good morning, everyone, and welcome. And it's wonderful to see all of you. I see faces that I saw last night. Um, and so it's great that you're able to make it here. Um, this session is <laughs> Student Data Privacy, Fundamentals and Beyond by Lynetta Tai. Lynette has, I asked her how long she's been working in this area. She says, well, I'm kids privacy and work with kids for over 25 years and then transitioned about five years ago into student data privacy. Has done a lot of work with one of our partners, COSIN, and um, has a tremendous amount of expertise. We invited Lynette back. She was so popular from last year and the topic is one that many of us struggle with <coughs> continually that we're really glad that she's able to come back and help us again. So I welcome Lynette. Here Thanks you go you. and another little. <laughs> I have so much I'm connected in so many ways right now. Um, not even really sure where to start. But thank you, thank you for inviting me back. Thank you for having me. It's, it's a treat for me to come out here and talk about this topic. I'm gonna go through a lot of information today and I, I always preface this by saying this is for you. So as I talk, if you have questions, if something isn't making sense, please just raise your hand, shout out. This is to make sure that you get the information you need. I've done this a few times. So just to introduce myself uh, briefly, um, as you heard, I've been doing this a long time. I've been in the compliance space for many years now. And I work on all sides of the table. So I work with companies, ed tech companies that are making products that you bring into your schools, that you bring into your classrooms. I work with schools and districts, helping them to build their compliance programs, manage this world. I also continue to work in the entertainment sector and other sectors. So what I try to do is kind of bring what I know from other mature privacy sectors into this world where really, in a lot of ways, we have some old laws, but we're also really just getting started. So enough about me. Let's talk about you and why you're here and what is it that we're talking about anyway when we talk about data privacy. Um, because oftentimes I go through a very long presentation about data privacy and we talk about the laws and, and then I get these sort of, well, why does this matter? Right? Why does this matter? And so I think it's important that we start with that and define our terms a bit. What are we talking about when we say data privacy? And why is it important? Like, yeah, yeah, we know we have to comply with the laws, but really, why? And so it's, uh, when we talk about data privacy, we're going to talk about what's here, right? the legal frameworks, the ethical frameworks, what data we collect, what we can and cannot do with it, how we handle it, how we keep it, um, the access limited. But that's not always the same as why it matters. Right? Of course, there are no regulators in the room, so I can say things like that. <coughs> If I ask you what you think, you know, what data privacy means to you, you may give me a certain answer. If I ask you, you'll give me another answer. If I ask a child, if I ask a student, um, they're going to give me a completely different answer, and often their answer is actually closer to why it's important than anything else. I'll give you an example. We're going to talk about all this legal mumbo jumbo and how do we work with it and what do we do with it. But if I speak to a child and I talk about data privacy, they don't really understand what I'm talking about not in the terms that we use. Here's how privacy plays out for kids, for our students. A child will, of course, when they are 13 or older, go onto social media and have an account, and their parents will be friends with them on the account, and they're fine with that. And they will post anything and everything, right? What I ate for lunch, you know, who I talk to, the like mundane details of their lives. And they may be talking on a thread with a parent, or with, a, with another friend, but it's invisible to the parent. If the parent chimes in on that thread, that's private. What are you doing? What are you talking to me and my friends? That's private. It's not private. Everyone in the world can see it. But it's personal. It's personal. If you, for those of you who have children, if your kids are home and they're in the other room, they're hanging out with their friends, you may be in the kitchen, hearing every single word, right? Listening intently, like glass to the, glass to the door there. Um, but if you went and you sat down with those kids, what are you doing? This is our time, this is private. 
This is personal. And that's what they mean. Personal, private, it's contextual. It's not just about information out there, but what is the context in which we're sharing it? Who has access to that information? Who is allowed to engage with us? And that is fundamentally why privacy matters, because it's personal, because we all have a different idea of what should happen with information about us. And we're not just talking about data. Right? We're talking about the student. We're talking about the child. So we, we get lost in the data fields of it all. But really, we're talking about what is the impact on the student if I release their grades? Are they embarrassed? Are they happy? Is it information someone shouldn't see? It's personal, right? And there's a real impact, an emotional impact. And that's why it matters, right? So that's the framework, especially as I go through the laws, which we're going to get to the, like, a little bit dry stuff, right? As I go through that. Keep in mind, this is really all about that student, that child at the core, right? And how our behavior around their information is really should be seen as our behavior around them. We have a fundamental responsibility to protect the student, keep the student safe in your four walls. That fundamental responsibility today extends to the data. Now we have a whole mess of laws to contend with. Um, and it is complicated, it's a real matrix. We're gonna try to unpack this and tease these out a little bit. So in the US, we protect data by sector. Your financial data is subject to special protections, your health data, data of children under the age of 13, and student data. The rest of us, you know, there are privacy policies, but kind of on our own. In the EU, overseas, actually globally, there's more of a fundamental personal right to privacy. And we're starting to see that trickle in in conversation here. But right now, you work in what we describe as a heavily regulated sector. So we start with the Federal Trade Commission. Section 5 of the FTC Act says you may not engage, if you are a commercial entity, you may not engage in deceptive or misleading practices. Commercial entity only because FTC doesn't have a purview over nonprofits. But they expect you to tell the truth, too. Basically what that means is if I say something in my privacy policy, it should be true. And it should accurately reflect what I am doing with the data, not what the organization whose privacy policy I, I copy is doing with the data. So the first thing is our privacy policies need to be true, they need to be accurate, they need to be not misleading. Then on top of that we have the sector rules, right? We have uh, PERPA, the granddaddy of student data privacy laws, which we'll talk about. We have uh, PPRA, we have COPPA, which applies to the vendors, not to you, but you may take on certain responsibilities under COPPA. And then we have your state regulation, and then of course your district has its own ideas and norms about what should be going on with respect to student data privacy. So how on earth do you operate in all of this mess, right, in all of this complexity? So we're going to talk a little bit about the laws, and then we're going to talk about, well, how do you start you know, moving forward within these frameworks? State laws, uh, just briefly, <laughs> I think the slide speaks for itself. There have been over 600 student data privacy bills written in the U.S. across the states in the past four years. So something's wrong. Not sure what, but they're trying to protect something. And we'll talk a little bit about Oregon law and what's happening generally across the state because there are some common threads we can pull. And the point of compliance, at least the way I operate in compliance, is not just to comply with the here and now, but to look at the big picture and say, what is it that people are most concerned with? Let's set ourselves up to address that so that as this regulation keeps coming in and keeps piling on, we don't have to change. We're already set up for success because we understand the fundamental concepts that underlie all of these regulations. So let's talk about FERPA. FERPA's been around since 1974, so we should all really understand it, right? Even the former Chief Privacy Officer of the U.S. Department of Education would tell you that there are areas of FERPA that are just a little murky and just a little hard to understand. FERPA is fundamentally an access law. FERPA was written when data was on paper and it basically was written to say, hey, you know what, parents and students when they're 18 or 
when they matriculate to a higher education institution, they have certain rights to see the information the school has on them. And we call that information an education record. An education record is just about anything and everything you collect from or about a student. It's their grades, it's their parents' information, it's their behavior, it's their health record, it's whether they beat someone up in recess or whether they got an A on that report card. It's everything you've got. It's custodial relationships. It's all of it. Right? It's part of the education record. There are a couple of exceptions. Right? Some handwritten <coughs> notes for Patel's book, handwritten notes written by maybe a teacher's <coughs> aide as kind of a memory help, not part of the education record. If you have students grading each other's papers, until you record those grades in the grade book, not part of the education record. Pretty much it. Right? Everything else is part of the education record. And what FERPA tells us is that if we are going to share personally identifiable information from the education record, we have to get the parents' written consent first. Seems simple, right? What's so hard about that? Except FERPA has 17 exceptions to that. Um, because like all good privacy laws, it's broad and wide. And then it says, well, this is a rule unless all of these other things might happen, in which case the rule doesn't apply. And that's where it gets complicated. So we'll talk about that. What's personally identifiable information under FERPA? The usual suspects, as I refer to it. Name, email address, street address, parents' names, um, social security number, biometric record, persistent identifiers, things that follow us. Um, are like all of this technology, um, persistent identifiers. Other indirect identifiers. A date of birth alone is not identifiable. But if you combine that with other information, like a mother's maiden name or a place of birth, it becomes identifiable. So when you combine indirect identifiers in certain ways, you render something identifiable. And FERPA says, in those cases, you have to consider it to be identifiable. And this is the kicker. Other identifiers that alone or in combination can lead the reasonable person in the school community to identify the individual. What does that mean? It means if I'm in a small town and I talk to you about the third grade boy with the blonde hair who kicked the winning field goal on Saturday, in the game on Saturday, and had that kerfuffle in the playground, you probably know who I'm talking about. That town is small enough. Thus, I've identified that individual, and under FERPA, that is considered personally identifiable information. So what does that mean in practice? It means that when we're releasing information, we have to be mindful of where we're releasing it, the combinations of information we're releasing, our sample size, and whether or not we truly de-identify the information before we give it out, or have we gotten the proper consent. Now, we're going to not unpack all 17 exceptions of FERPA, because we'd be here all day. Um, but we're going to talk about the two most commonly discussed and commonly used exceptions. And so this is when you don't have to get a parent's written consent to release information. One is directory information. Directory information is not a way to release information to a technology provider, period, full stop. The reason is that when you release directory information, you no longer have control over it. And a technology provider is probably creating an education record when the student uses their product. The student goes into a math app, maybe they need to create an account, so you're releasing their email address to the provider. Seems simple. If you've, if you've categorized the email address as directory information, you don't have to get parental consent. It's all good. Except everything a student does in that app is part of the education record, and you no longer have control over it. So this is not meant for that kind of sharing. Directory information is information, and this is a really strange exception in a privacy law. Directory information is information you can release without consent if it is not invasion of privacy, not otherwise considered harmful if released. And then FERPA goes on to give us examples of what might be not an invasion of privacy or not harmful if released, and it tells us it's things like a name and an email address and a student's height and weight and things that, you know, and their awards and what grade they're in, things that they also consider to be personally identifiable, that we're not supposed to release without consent. So it's a 
little bit, so what's that about? Directory information is there so that you can go about the business of being a school. The Department of Education will, will put it this way. Students go to, don't go to school anonymously. You've got to take attendance. Do you want to get parents' permission every time you record a student's attendance in a grade book? No. Do you want to get a parent's permission every time you publish their photo in a yearbook? Or you put the names on the back of their sports jerseys? Or you publish the program in the school play? When you do that, you are releasing their personal information. Do you want to get parents' permission every time you do that? No, of course not. Your, your organization would come to a grinding halt. Your coaches would revolt. What you need to do with directory information is define what you consider to be directory information within the confines of the guidance that FERPA provides, not an invasion of privacy, not harmful if released. Notify parents and students at the beginning of the year and say, this is the information that we consider to be directory information. If you would like to opt out of this directory information sharing for your child, here's how to do it and here's when to do it. And once you do that, you are free to share the information for, to, to operate as a school. Sometimes schools and districts will do something even a little narrower with directory information. And in their notice, they will say, this is the information we consider to be directory information, and this is what we will use it for. We will use it to publish the yearbook and put the names on the backs of the jerseys and publish the school play and maybe do our you know, emergency phone tree list. But we're not going to use it for anything else. And if you do that, it's a great privacy practice. You just have to make sure that if you define how you will use directory information in your directory <coughs> information notice, you can't use it for anything else unless you go and provide additional notice. So it's something to be really thoughtful about. Uh, but that's what directory information is for, not for sharing information with vendors. This is how we <coughs> most commonly share information with vendors. There are other exceptions. There are research exceptions, things like that. But this is, the, this is the one that gets used most often. It's the school official's exception. A school official is someone who would otherwise perform a service for which you would use employees. Your employees actually are school officials, your teachers. They get access to data without parental consent because they operate in your school. They're performing this educational service for you. A vendor, a consultant, a contractor comes in, is performing an educational service you would otherwise use employees for, they can be, you can decide that they are a school official. You set up your criteria for what's a school official. You, it's part of your disclosure to parents, hey, this is how we categorize school officials. This is what we, what we think about, right? And then you can designate a contractor as a school official. And here's the kicker. As a school official, an ed tech contractor may only use the personally identifiable information that you provide them with to support your school purpose. So that's it. They don't get to do anything else with it. They don't get to sell it. They don't get to market it. It's just your school purpose. They're under your direct control. What that means is whatever you say what happens with the data goes. You say delete it, it gets deleted. You say use it for this purpose, it gets used for that purpose. That's it. They're under your control. So you always, yes? Would that, would that direct control <coughs> and saying delete this information? apply to what the vendor has declared to be non-identifiable data also? Until, unless you have, uh, so FERPA applies to the personally identifiable information. Um, but oftentimes in contracts, what we do is we say, th the vendor should be claiming rights to de-identify data if they want to do that, Okay. right? Okay, so they could, have, they could have a clause in there that says, this even is, after we sever relationships, we're going to keep the DNA. And you agree to that or you don't agree to it, right? It's yours to decide. I will say that on the vendor side, it's actually incredibly hard to, because the way de-identification tends to work with vendors is that you've got this bucket of data from all these school systems, right? And they're separated in a, a database, but the de-identification process is just on mass. Right? You just take a whole bunch of information, you strip it out, and then you put that de-identified data into another bucket. So for someone to come and say, I want my students de-identified, like, we can't find it anymore. The point was to de-identify it so that we can't track it back to the student, so it's really hard to find that. But it is your decision as to whether or not you want to allow them those rights. It's very common to allow them those rights. Uh, almost every, sta every state law that applies here allows certain rights. You want to make sure that what they're using it for 
that A, they're de-identifying it in accordance with the FERPA standards, which are broad and wide and vague, and B, that they're using it for legally permissible purposes. Because there are restrictions, and every state says you can do pretty much these three things, and that's about it. And those three things are product improvement and product development, customized and adaptive learning, and demonstrating the efficacy of your product, including in the marketing of the product. And that's the one that always makes everyone sit back and say, I don't want you to use my data for marketing. Here's what it means. It means I'm a vendor, and I want to say, our product is used by 50,000 students. And I want to put that on my ad. That is use of de-identified data to demonstrate the efficacy of your product for marketing purposes. 100,000 students improve their reading scores using our product. That is an example of using de-identified data for marketing purposes to demonstrate the efficacy of your product. So it's not as, it's not, it's a far cry from an identifiable marketing purpose. Now there are deeper tunnels into that, but the de-identification standard under FERPA doesn't really allow us much, doesn't really allow us to get very close to the individual. Any other questions on that? I do have, so when we say use data only for K-12 purpose, so if we're talking about the identifiable data. Yeah. So if we've got a vendor, I can think of a couple that we've done, wanted to do work with in the past. They have some uses of the data that I would say is outside that purpose. And in those cases, we've allowed them to get permission directly from the parent and not from us. Is that permissible? Absolutely. Absolutely. You don't have to use the school official's exception. It's there for your convenience, right? It's there so that you can bring technology in without having to get all the written parent consent. But if you want to say to a vendor, it's this particular use case, we're not comfortable with it, but you know, go forth and ask the parent, that's, that's absolutely fair game. Fair game. They can't re-disclose the data without going back to the parent and asking for consent. You give it to them for the school purpose, they want to do something else with it, they want to share it with someone that's not for the school purpose, they have to get written consent from the parent. And by the way, almost every state law restricts the marketing purposes even with consent. So there is not a lot of commercial use of student data happening legally. Your responsibility with your school officials are A, to let parents know what you consider to be a school official, and B, to make sure you are giving the vendor the minimally required data. Don't just open the floodgates because you've declared them to be a school official. And then remember, they're supposed to be under your direct control. The contract is an instrument of direct control. So in the contract, what are your expectations for them around the data? When do you want them to delete it? Do you want them to just, you know, do you want to re, what are the things you want to make clear in the contract as being things that you require? And that's your instrument of control. The contract is legally binding. Parents and eligible students always have a right to access the personal information in the education record and request that you amend it, correct it. They can't correct grades, they can't go crazy and be like, Johnny deserved an A. They can correct mistakes. And if you say, no, we don't agree with that, we think the record is fine, they have a right to a hearing and all sorts of process. So you need to essentially have a process on hand even if you may use it only infrequently. Because when this request comes in, you have a limited window in which to provide them with the data. Reasonable period of time and some states limit that to between 30 to 45 days. If your data is held by a vendor, make sure that as part of your contract, your direct control, there's some mechanism by which if you get a request from a parent to exercise their FERPA rights, that vendor is going to cooperate with you and help you in some sort of timely manner. It shouldn't be a surprise to them when this request comes in, so they should know up front in your contract, we may at some point ask you for Johnny's data. I'm going to pick on Johnny today. And when that happens, we need you to help us out. De-identifying student data, I touched on this a bit. The FERPA standard is, you know, as it's standard with personal information, it's broad and wide. The de-identification standard is broad and wide. A reasonable determination must be made. You know, the student is not personally identifiable, whether it's through single or multiple releases. What that means is your sample size matters. The other data that you may be released already as directory information matters. The context in which you are sharing de-identified information matters. 
and the data factors and how you're combining them matters. Again, remember that date of birth, mother's maiden name, place of birth, identifies someone, whereas date of birth alone doesn't identify someone. Right? So how you're combining information matters. <clears throat> the cost of noncompliance. Why are people so concerned with FERPA and, um, you know, A, it's a confusing law, it's not cleanly written. But B, the cost of noncompliance are high, so here's how it works. And we often say, oh, they could take away your federal funding and that never happened. What happens when you get a letter from the Department of Education saying we're starting a FERPA investigation is a, a long process. The Department of Education does not move swiftly when it comes to their investigations. <laughs> Understatement. Last one took five years. So that's five years of you dealing with your lawyers and producing documents and responding to letters from the Department of Education. Right? Things, you're dealing with stuff that, that is taking you away from your job and it's costing you time and money. The Department of Education will then, if they find that you were not in compliance with FERPA, issue a letter of finding and it will more than likely include a plan for you to get into compliance and that plan will be their idea and their timing, not yours. If you do not comply with that letter, if you're dragging your feet or you're refusing to comply, then they can pull the trigger and say, we're gonna revoke your federal funding or we're gonna pause your federal funding. They've never done that. But that's not to say that this law doesn't have teeth because going through a regulatory investigation um, is not something that I wish on anyone, right? It's just not. It is expensive, it is time consuming, it is stressful, it is a lot of lawyers digging through your paperwork, um, you know, and preparing documents and presentations for the regulators, and it lasts a long time, you know, five to seven years some of these things take. If one of your vendors causes you to fall out of compliance with FERPA, then you are precluded from giving them student data for a period of five years. And for vendors, that's a significant trigger, because this day and age, that is front page newspaper headline, and that puts a vendor out of business. So this idea that it only applies to the school system and vendors don't have to worry about it is not really true. They're very much aware, at least those who have any sort of grounding in the education sector, that there's, there's a problem here for them. And the states, by the way, so all of these state laws have learned from FERPA, this idea that, oh, FERPA's never been enforced is, is sort of the vernacular how we talk about it. When it comes to uh, companies, the states basically said, I know, we're gonna have our state laws penalize the vendors. Uh, we'll, we'll just get some money from them. So they've kind of learned this idea that, um, about how to, how to build teeth into, into uh, a student data privacy law. Yeah? Well, I have a question about the third party data providers. Okay, so you say no to the Joe company here, you're, you're not compliant. You tried to get in three years to get in the door. Somebody's keeping track and say, oh, well, it, it's only in three years and for just five that we know about this. And he says, but I've changed. And now I am perfect compliant. That will all be up to the Department of Education and they'll issue that in their findings. So recently, there was a recent finding uh, with Agora Charter Schools and the issue stemmed from a vendor and their terms not being compliant and the school system essentially requiring that parents and students use that product, right? The school system was essentially asking parents, we need to waive your FERPA rights. We know this vendor has not quite got it right. We need you to use this technology anyway. It's not okay, don't do that. And the finding, because the investigation took so long, it took five years, what happened was when they issued their finding letter, it basically said, school district, you cannot work with them if their terms say these things that they've said in the past, but they had fixed their terms by then, it had been five years. However, if they had moved faster, this would have been a situation where the vendor was banned for five years, and the Department of Education will make that clear in their, in their finding letters to when, you, you know, you cannot use them for, you cannot give them data for five years, or you cannot give them data as long as their terms say X, whatever it may be. For that vendor, the PR nightmare has only just begun because it's not just you, right? This becomes, again, a media story. So they are just trying to, so you, you may, the Department of Education may say to you, it's okay, go forth, and you do the diligence, and you feel like, you know what, they've really cleaned up, we can keep using them. 
someone else is not going to be so happy about it, and it's going to drop them. So for the vendors, um, it's got some teeth. Is there any place where um, it's easy for business to find third parties who are in this process who are because these aren't these aren't fi these aren't declarations that you have to go out of business. It's no. just that you can't do business with districts, but districts. This is the, so the uh, Department of Education is getting better at so under under COPPA, the Federal Trade Commission publishes all of its settlements it's very public. They do press releases like it's a thing. Um, Department of Education has not been great about that, but they've gotten better. And studentprivacy.gov, uh, studentprivacy.ed.gov is their new student privacy website, newish privacy website. And on there, they're starting to publish letters of note, uh, which is basically all their investigations around FERPA. The, the one, the most recent one, which was Agora Charter Schools, is the one the finding that involved a vendor. We, we don't expect it to be the last one. We don't expect it to be the last one. So it'll be very public record. Um, so there is no, so to answer your question, the short answer is no, there is no database of vendors who have been found to be not in compliance uh, or who have caused a school system to be out of compliance. However, we think it's only happened for one time so far. Right? So. Uh, Agora Charter Schools was the FERPA case. You can look it up. It was an outfit in Florida that was, right? Um, but until they're found, until there's a finding, it's, it's confidential. But you will know when it happens, for sure. Reporters are just waiting for it. <laughs> They've got their pen, like, poised over the paper. Um, let's talk about a little bit about COPPA. To make it really clear, COPPA is not enforced against schools or districts, ever. It is enforced against vendors. It's enforced by the Federal Trade Commission. They have no purview over you. And the law was written to apply to operators of commercial websites and, and internet connected products that are intended in whole or in part for children under the age of 13. And what it requires is that if we're going to collect, if I'm an operator and I'm going to collect personal information from a child under the age of 13, I have to get the parent's consent first. And I have to do some things to verify that it's the parent giving consent. <coughs> it only applies to operators where the child is under the age of 13, where they know the child is under the age of 13, whether they're a third party embedded in a product for kids under the age of 13 and they know that that product's for kids under 13, doesn't apply to, apply to general audience products and services, unless there's a section in that product or service that is meant for kids under the age of 13. <coughs> in addition to requiring parental consent, there's an allowance that parents can get a copy of the personal information the vendor has collected about their child from their child and ask the vendor to either delete it or kind of keep what you've got, but don't collect anything else. This is tricky when it comes to these technology products in schools, because what you don't want is, I assume, is a whole mess of parents going over to a vendor and saying, hey, <laughs> I know that you know Mrs. Smith is using this math app in the classroom, but I want you to get my kids' data off of it. That's the education record. You're supposed to have direct control can't just go get rid of it, except that COPPA and FERPA were not written at the same time for the same purposes. COPPA was not written for education. It was basically an entertainment marketing law, restricting marketing. So this is an area where the laws just don't really get along. So it's an area where, where there is no guidance yet. We had a whole FTC, Department of Education, workshop about this in December, thinking about trying to create guidance. But here's my advice. This is not legal advice, but here's like the reality of how this probably should work. One of the things that COPPA allows, COPPA requires the operator to get consent from the parent. You can, if you want to, stand in the shoes of the parent and act uh, and, and essentially get the consent for the operator. Right? You say to the operator, I'm going to manage the consents. My advice to operators, my advice to you is that if a parent wants to exercise their rights under COPPA and delete the data, that it go through you the way it would if it were a FERPA request. Because at the very least, you can ask the operator for a copy of the data before the parent has it deleted from the operator. So you're not interfering with the parent's rights, you're just making sure that you have a copy of the education record before the operator deletes it. 
This doesn't happen often, but it's something to think about because if you really get into the weeds on these laws, they do not line up. Um, one place where they don't line up is the definition of personal information, right? Purpose, personally identifiable information, COPPA is personal information. This is the definition of personal information under COPPA. A lot of the same suspects that we have under FERPA. <coughs> um, it adds a few more geolocation sufficient to identify a street and town. Geolocation that tells me what country you're in or what state you're in is not identifiable unless I combine it with other information. But when you get kind of granular and I know where that kid is, that's identifiable. Persistent identifier when used to, to when they can recognize a user over time across unrelated sites and services. That's tracking, right? Building a profile to behaviorally target is not legal under COPPA. Persistent identifier. Yes. Just go back to the last slide. So the photographs, videos, and audio files. So that's an interesting one with the heightened interest in security mm -hmm. that we've got in districts now. And um, so your vendor who's yeah. taking those photos, when the child is under the age of 13, there should be a parental consent mechanism in there. And it could be that you have contractually agreed to handle that consent. The vendor should be providing you with notice of their privacy practices. <coughs> a link to their privacy policy, the things you need in order to provide actual notice to parents about what they're consenting about. Now, and now, for videos, that would even apply to group videos, group pictures? Yes, uh, photos and videos that contain a child's likeness, or image, voice, audio that contains a child's voice. Consider personal information under COPPA. Parent, if you're collecting it from the child, parent permission needed to be obtained first. Any other questions on that? Can I check to understand that real quick? Yes, so please. Under, under FERPA, is a student's photograph considered direct information? It could be, okay. if you deem it so. Okay, so is it a XYZ school have uploads of kids' photos, right? And teacher comes to you and says, can you upload all my kids' photos into the XYZ school? Which could be direct me over here, could be personal under COPPA. It's definitely personal information. And so then you've got to push it through the laws, right? So I'm collecting a photo under FERPA. Have I gotten parental permission, written consent? If not, what exception under FERPA am I using to share this information with the vendor? Okay, I've done that. Wait, the kids are under 13, and the vendor's going to be collecting it directly from the child. So if a teacher gives out a child's personal information, COPPA is not triggered. It's when I collected, the, so the child, in this situation, the child is going to upload their photo. COPPA is triggered. Child's under the age of 13. Have I, uh, has the vendor gotten parental consent, or if I, does it say in their terms that, that I'm going to manage the consents, and do I agree to that? By the way, that's an option, it's not a requirement, um, but do I agree to that? Great, okay, I can move forward. So you've got to, you know, oftentimes we get this, oh, they're not under 13, so it's all good. Like, don't forget about the other laws that apply. Yes. I think it's useful for folks in Washington to keep in mind also that there's a state of Washington like a piece of legislation called SUPER. I forget what the acronym is for, but you can find it. Yeah, student user protection, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, student user protection, blah, blah, yes. blah. And it's, basically, <laughs> it's basically COPPA with taking out the 13-year-old restrictions for all kids yeah. and taking out the commercial restriction also. So 501c3s aren't covered. The state itself isn't covered, even though the state is constantly in violation of their own law. We'll find out. Yeah. Um, but, so when we hear this about COPPA in Washington, it's really it's all kids. Yes, <coughs> remember that on top of all this, we've got state laws to get through. Um, this is important too. Other information collected um, that is tied to personal information from our child. If I have a child's email address and I've gotten consent for that, and then I ask the child, what are your favorite sports? And the child tells me soccer. And I combine that soccer with the child's email address. I've made soccer personal, personal information under COPPA. And so the vendor had to have gotten consent for it. So when they sent you that notice, they need to have sort of explained, here's the information I'm going to collect. And it better have included soccer. Yes, there's a question about that. Well, I, I had a question about sort of a practical um, implication uh, and it, it's sort of an earlier point of if a parent exercises their right to have data removed from a vendor, say like a, a map app or a website, and that map app or website is the core of the teacher's unit on fractions, how 
how did that, the teacher comes back and says, well, how can I not have this student use the app that is what I need to use to teach fractions? Right. What happened in that case? It kind of goes beyond the law, but like when it well, we had a we had a whole Department of Education FTC workshop in December. The videos are posted online. Alan was on one of the panels where we talked about the fact that this doesn't make sense. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Welcome to privacy law. <laughs> one of the reasons why I recommend that you work with the vendor to have those parents come to you is not just so that you can get a copy of the education record before it deletes it, but so that you can have a conversation with the parent and say, listen, before you do this, I need you to understand Johnny's going back to pencil and paper, right? Like, this is what we do. And they can still say, yes, great, I don't care. Johnny's not using the app. But it allows you to at least try to have a sensible conversation. It's not perfect, and there are no easy answers on that one. Yeah? Mm-hmm. If you're choosing a digital curriculum school, I thought the school district was the first, I mean, it's the administrator of that student data in terms of, like, a parent doesn't have access. Yeah. Yeah, that to me is a big question. Yes, so the uh, question is essentially, we thought that, it, um, that the FTC guidance says essentially that when the school is providing consent in lieu of the parent, and the school can only provide that consent when the data is used for the school purpose, not for a commercial purpose. But when that's happening, the idea was, does, isn't the FTC saying that then the school is the, is the sort of controller of the data? Um, and that, 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 so this, this murkiness doesn't really apply. Um, the FTC said a lot of things in their FAQs, <laughs> and <clears throat> there's no statutory basis for their guidance around this school position. And it's one of the reasons, by the way, why we had this December workshop, is that they overreached a little bit. There's no statutory basis for what they said there. So is there, are there examples in the wire? So I know there are examples in the wire where essentially if the vendor receives the request from the parent, the first thing they do is try to contact the administrator of the data set, right? Or, or of their, because they're in a contractual, <laughs> they're in a contractual relationship. Right. Absolutely, they don't want to be working with a parent, right? Are there examples in the wild where the parent, I mean, is there real world examples, maybe not statutory yet, of the parent essentially having that data removed without there being notice to the contract company? Um, so the question is, how, do we have any real world examples of a parent removing uh, data and you know exercising their copyright to have a vendor remove data and not actually notifying the school? Um, no. There is certainly a real world example, and I don't know how it's been resolved, but there is a real world example of a parent going to a vendor, going to a school and saying, I'm gonna exercise my copyright with this vendor and you need to make it happen. Um, and the school sort of saying, you know, we're not, we're not sure what to do with this. Um, there's no law here. It's where the two laws, COPPA was written, COPPA was basically written as a marketing preclusion for the entertainment industry. COPPA was written when all of a sudden the government realized, oh, all that marketing to kids, it's happening online now and they're just able to collect whatever information they want. We need to limit that. So let's, uh, let's put this law into place. Uh, not, um, not any relationship with FERPA, not any consideration for FERPA. Persistent identifiers, this is a tricky one. COPPA considers a persistent identifier to be personal information when it's used to track someone across time over unrelated sites and services. <laughs> it's not personal information when used for basic product functioning, analytics, uh, remembering someone's preferences, network security, authenticating users. COPPA says you don't have to get consent for these things. But this is a limited list. This is, this is it. The vendor should be, when you agree to act in lieu of the parents and provide consent, the vendor should, should send you notice. And this is what needs to be in the notice. It is not the privacy policy, although it does contain a link to the privacy policy. It's basically a restatement of some of the things in the privacy policy, but it should be a separate sheet that comes to you. 
we talked about this, parents always have certain rights. They can say to the vendor, you can collect the information, but you can't disclose it. You can collect the information, oh wait, I've changed my mind, I'm revoking my permission. Gets complicated in the school system. COPPA has a lot of teeth when it comes to schools, when it comes to, sorry, not to schools, not to schools, to vendors. Cost of non-compliance, $40,000 and change per violation, that is per student. That's how that adds up. So that's, you know, think about one class from a student, you're, you know, you're in high six figures. And COPPA has been enforced. COPPA has been enforced and gets enforced uh, fairly often. One of the things regulators are particularly concerned with right now are the persistent identifiers, so tracking, very hot topic. Their cases are all available publicly uh, on ftc.gov. They issue a press release every time they have a COPPA finding, um, and the fines are high. They also tend to require the settlements, the things that don't get reported in the press, are that the settlements also say, hey, that data you collected in violation of COPPA, we need you to delete it all. Delete it all. So you're a new mobile app developer, you're kind of starting over oftentimes. Uh, provide some consumer education, all your employees have to get trained. And the kicker sometimes is compliance training and audits. I've seen the FTC say to companies, not uncommonly, Every year I want annual compliance, tra compliance audits done by a third party reporting up to the FTC, say the next four to sometimes 20 years. That's a big, big penalty. It's expensive to violate COPPA. Not for you, and the FTC has said publicly, we will never enforce against the school system, so you don't have to worry about that. You do need to make sure that your vendors are compliant with COPPA. Let's talk about PPRA very briefly. We don't ever talk about PPRA. It's kind of the silent law that is out there and no one really talks about. I don't know why. But it's what I call the sex, drugs, and rock and roll law. Basically, if you are going to survey your students about any of these sensitive topics, you need to have gotten the parents' permission first. And you need to give them an opportunity to review the survey instrument, whether you're doing it or whether you're having a vendor do it. PPRA also says some interesting things about uh, if you do not have policies in place for how you're going to do all this already, you have to actually work with your parents to write policies that will explain to them how you're going to give them access to the survey instruments and how you're going to unpack all this. I don't know anyone who's done that, who's actually sort of invited the community in to write policy together. Um, I'm not sure how well that would go. My hope is that you all already have a policy in place around PPRA. If not, perhaps you should quietly write one. Um, PPRA also allows use of student data for certain marketing purposes when they're educational in nature. Colleges, scholarships, uh, book clubs, military recruitment. That is then, and we never talk about that, but PPRA is actually, some people say PPRA limits marketing. It's actually permissive of certain specific types of marketing, but the state laws actually took care of that. So let's talk about the state student data privacy laws. There are 125 and counting. Um, Minnesota is working on theirs now. We think there's not great agreement between the Senate and the House, so we're not sure it's gonna happen in this session, but they're writing a lot of, um, I think there are three versions of a student data privacy bill floating in, in Minnesota right now. <clears throat> so every state's got one or more than one. A lot of them basically reiterate what is already in FERPA. Parents have access rights, you have control, vendors can do limited things. Personal information can only be used for the K-12 school purpose. Access, third parties access to data is limited. Where states are moving is marketing <coughs> restrictions. And we'll talk about Oregon's law. Uh, so, um, the states are basic, which is, which is a fairly typical statement of the marketing restriction in the law. States are basically saying, listen, you cannot use the student data to market to students. And in some states, they're saying, you cannot use the student data to market to parents or to anyone at all, and we don't care if the parent gives permission, you still can't do it. Oregon has got, a, I think Oregon's law has been on the books since 2015, so it was one of the first movers. Um, and it's got some pretty standard provisions. Uh, I say it's modeled after the California law, um, modeled loosely, but still California had their SOPIPA law, which, which 18 states quickly copied. 
there's some murkiness to these laws and it's worth noting because if you're having trouble understanding your state law you're not alone everyone is having trouble understanding the deep dark corners of their state law because they're not written very cleanly Oregon law has preclusions against using student data to target advertising cannot sell student data. I don't know who, what vendor is selling student data. It's not legal under FERPA, COPPA, PPR, like there's no legal construct under which you can sell student data. I don't consider when companies are sold to be selling the data so much as like selling the company. And yes, the data goes with it, but the FTC has already said the privacy policy has to say it, it <coughs> remains subject to those protections that, are, that you've already agreed to, or you have to have opt-out rights. Like that's already part of federal privacy construct, but the states are very concerned that someone is selling data. There's also this idea that all privacy laws essentially have this concept that you hold on to the data for as long as you need it. COPPA says you can only collect the minimally required data. You cannot condition a child's participation in something with giving more data than is needed. Minimal data. So you collect the minimal data, and then when you're done with it, you've got to delete it. State laws are saying you've got to delete it when that contract ends, or within a reasonable period of time. Some of the states have learned a little bit. California says when the contract ends, you need to delete the data. Well, what if the contract is for your platform of record, right? And you're in the middle of renegotiating and the vendor said, listen, we're going to give you another month while we work through these renegotiations. Like there's no contract, but just keep using it. California law says you have to delete that. You don't want them to delete the data for your whole SIS. You don't have to re-upload that. So a lot of states have learned from that and said, listen, within a reasonable period of time, within 30 days after the contract ends, within 45 days after the contract <laughs> ends, uh, we're seeing a law, I think it's Minnesota, I can't remember what state, that's basically saying, if you're in renegotiation, I think it's Illinois, if you're in the process of renegotiation, there's a little bit of a grace period there too. Um, but at any time, if you say delete the data, you still get to delete the data. Purpose still applies here. Here's the weird one for me in Oregon law. Does anyone know what this means? Person identifiable materials that regard a student in this manner. I don't know what that means. There's a lot of bad grammar in state laws. <laughs> and that matters <coughs> when you're enforcing it. Because I'm not an attorney, but if I were one, I could drive a truck through that loophole. No, the state laws where, where for me, in my opinion, they're missing is they're not really defining personal information. They're saying covered information is personally identifiable in these circumstances. Well, it shouldn't be up to everyone to determine what is personally identifiable and what is not personally identifiable. We have workable definitions in FERPA and COPPA. It would be nice to leverage those a little bit and some common sense. Targeted advertising. Advertising presented to a student based on information obtained or inferred about a student's online behavior, usage of applications, or covered information. Very common definition. There are unintended consequences to these laws, and I'm not picking on Oregon. This is across the country. Information obtained or inferred by their usage of the application. Well, it's an app for third graders, so I'm going to infer that they are third graders. They're about eight years old, is that right? And so I am going to maybe serve ads based on the fact that they are third graders who are eight years old and not based on you know, what might be appropriate for a 17 year old. Is that targeted advertising? Am I allowed to do that? I have no idea. Can I market an all women's college to women only? Not sure. Uh, can I take a class photo and market that photo to the parents? Because that's definitely taking student information and using it to target marketing. Some states have started to build in exceptions. These things are written broadly and widely, and no state has provided us with guidance on how to implement. There are a lot of organizations coming out and saying, this means this. No one actually knows what it means until the state says so. Okay. Your lawyer, your interpretation. Ask your state board of education, ask your state attorney general. They are the ones who know what this means. Well, actually, sometimes they don't know what it means, but they're the authorities. Right? <coughs> so what do we do with all of this? Right? It's a lot of loss. It's a lot to unpack. And frankly, it just comes down to good fundamental data privacy protections. 
So first, we're collecting a lot of data. Do we need to collect everything we've got? Are you still collecting social security numbers? Burn them. Just have a bonfire, okay? Are you, are, is there other information that you're collecting that you don't need? Schools collect a lot of information. So get very clear on what's required by your state. Also get very clear on your state's data retention requirements. Some states say you've got to keep the education record for 60 years, which is, I don't understand. Um, <laughs> and in paper format. Right, and in paper. <coughs> get very clear on what that means. Do you have to collect, do you have to retain all the data fields? Or can you get rid of the sensitive information attached to those records? Because data is an asset and it's a liability. If you've got a lot of social security numbers on your records, you've got to protect them with incredibly high standards and that's expensive. And if you have a data breach, social security number definitely triggers a legal requirement for notification. What if you just deleted all the social security numbers but kept everything else? Get clear about what your state law requires you to keep when it comes to that education record so that you can maybe try to delete the stuff that's expensive and risky to have on hand. Do not allow everyone access to all the data. Your teachers need access to a certain amount of data in order to function, yes, of course. They don't need access to the data on the students in the classroom of students they are not teaching. Sometimes your systems are set up that it's very hard to limit access or to customize access, but wherever possible, you wanna limit access to data across your organization to what we call rule and role based. <coughs> you are a coach, you need access to certain information, maybe you need access to students' grades, there's probably certain health information you need, you need access to, taking the kids on the road and that kid's got asthma and you've gotta know that, you've gotta be able to handle that, right? But they don't need access to every student's information just the ones that are in their care. If you're building products, create a dummy data set for testing wherever possible. Sometimes we have to test using live data because there's something specific about the way we've configured the data that causes a problem. But wherever possible, have a dummy data set that you use for testing. So you're not putting real student data in an unprotected environment. Our test environments, our staging environments are usually not protected in the same way as a production environment is. We just don't build them with all security in mind. So be mindful of that when you're using data. Codify your de-identification protocols. The FTC talks a lot about reasonable security. There's not a privacy law in the US that doesn't somewhere suggest that you should also implement reasonable security, but we're not gonna tell you what that means. Um, the FTC has started telling us what it means after the big lab MD kerfuffle lawsuit um, where the FTC essentially sued uh, saying there was not reasonable security in place and lab MD said, you never told us what reasonable security is. How are we supposed to do this? And so it's been a very long case. Um, but the FTC has started to put out its cases about what, where, they've, where they have gone after organizations for lack of reasonable security. Again, FTC does not enforce against nonprofits, but good guidance to know. And they've got a great so primer, it's maybe two, three pages on what constitutes reasonable security, and they, they unpack some of their cases for us. But this is their list, essentially, right? Encrypt. Encrypt using a, a current standard appropriate to the sensitivity of the data that you've got. Regularly patch and update. Shouldn't be that patches are waiting. Yes? Encryption. Encryption disk or encryption in transit? Both. New York State requires <coughs> encryption of data at rest and in transit. Um, certainly you want to encrypt in transit. Depending on the sensitivity of the data, you want to encrypt <coughs> at rest as well. Sometimes field level encryption will break your system, right? But there are other ways around that, encrypting the system, things of that sort, that at least help bridge the gap a little bit. If you are doing any coding, any building in your system, use secure coding practices. OWASP has great standards on this. They're the go-to on that. Make sure your teams who are doing coding work are trained. Secure workstations, uh, your teachers and the passwords on the post-it notes. <laughs> they have to stop. Just go around one day and just pull them all off. That's what I do it. Send them a little note. A little love note from the IT team. We've removed your password. 
Um, I, I know of more security breaches that have happened because the students stole a teacher's password, went in, changed the admin credentials, changed their grades. In one case that was fairly recent, the student was arrested. Like, there are serious repercussions for this stuff and the teachers are actually, not intentionally, but the students are at risk here when they do these dumb things. Teachers shouldn't make it easy for them to do dumb things. Two-factor authentication, I know your superintendent is gonna say fine, but just not me. <laughs> <coughs> then you tell them that when they get that email, that phishing email, that what actually happens when they click on that link is that person may sit in the system. We think the lurk time is somewhere around 60 days now. They're just learning and they're sending all your superintendent's emails to their own email system so they can send their own email out to everyone else saying, I, I need those, those social security number, I need those payroll forms. Right? They specifically target leadership for these things. So the password hashes, um, encrypt before sending your data to the cloud. It's great that you're using the cloud, fantastic. If AWS goes down, the whole world is in trouble. But if it's not encrypted on the way there, it's not encrypted. Um, avoid the Java plugin. This is not Java code, but the, that plugin, there's a reason why it updates so often. Because it's not secure, it's not stable. Um, third party partners. You have to know what your vendors are doing. You have to be reading their privacy policies and their terms of use. I know it's hard, I know they're boring. I write them, I know they're boring. Um, find one that you can get through easily. Start with your school system's privacy policy. Does your school system have a privacy policy on your website? For many of you, the answer is going to be no. And for some of you, the answer is going to be yes, we do. And it's Blackboards or it's West Messengers or whoever built the system. That's not your privacy policy. It has nothing to do with you. If you can't understand your own school system's website privacy policy, there's got to be someone in the school system who wrote the thing. Right? or who knows who did. So start there. Can you unpack it? Because the point is that once you can understand one privacy policy in terms of use, they're not all the same. There's no template. But the general information that we are supposed to legally have in there is fairly consistent. What this applies to, what information we're collecting, what we do with it, third parties tracking technologies, whether we use cookies and what for, how you can opt out, our reasonable security measures, uh, third parties that we have that might be collecting data, um, a note about children under the age of 13 and how we're dealing with our COPPA responsibilities and how to contact us. And by the way, if you have questions <coughs> on the privacy policy or terms of use, use that contact us thing. There's someone there whose job it is to answer those questions. And sometimes that gets you past customer support. Like that gets you to the lawyer when you ask a privacy question. Um, I've done it several times myself with companies when I'm trying to understand their practices, maybe a third party for a vendor or for a school system, and I'm like, I can't even understand your privacy policy and your terms of use. And I don't wanna ask customer support because I'm gonna go around on this wheel of like it's not enough information for me. Go to the like, you know, legal at privacypolicy.com. Uh, sometimes you'll get a different answer, a different team. Think about this holistically. We can get lost in the weeds here, but really take a step back if you can, take a breath and think about, well, what do I want to do with data generally? I know I've, what the laws tell me I can't do. I know what my leadership wants me to do. I know I've got tons of technology providers. I've got my community norms. What can I do with the data? What should I do with the data? What is your school mission? support every student to succeed. I mean, schools have these amazing, very lofty missions. How does your use of data align with your school mission? Because that is a lens through which everyone in the organization can push their decisions through. These are not your policies, but this is on top of your policies. This is a holistic look. What do we want to do in the first place and why? How does use of data support us as a school system? Then from there, that's the lens through which I write policies. You are always in control of the data, period. Whether you give it to a vendor, you don't give it to a vendor, <coughs> you are in control, so you need to behave like you're in control. 
You need to have the policies, the procedures, the terms, the contracts. And this is not easy stuff because we're not lawyers, right? And we were not born to do this. This is not what we signed up for. And we're like, oh, I'm going to be a school CTO. We didn't sign up to be reading contracts all day. Slog through one until you understand it. Because when you understand the contract, when you really understand what it means, and you understand how you're going to use data and how you're not going to use data, you know where you can negotiate an agreement and where you can't. That is how you get a win when it comes to contracting negotiation. That's when you get, to, that's how you get to a place where you have a solution that meets your needs, is reasonable to the vendor, and you can move forward. There's nothing worse than a negotiation between a vendor and a school system where, for example, the vendor doesn't understand FERPA and the school system doesn't understand the agreement. It's like the wheels grind to a halt and the parties on both sides of the table are scratching their heads and not knowing what to do. The vendors know better equipped than you are to do this. They don't know schools. They may know the laws. They may have a great lawyer. They don't implement in schools. And it's your data. But you can't negotiate if you don't know what the rules are. So the more you learn, the more you get fluent in this, the easier these negotiations become. And as I always say, a red line is the start of a conversation. It's just someone saying, this doesn't really work for me. Can we do it a different way? So it shouldn't stop you in your tracks. It should be a way to engage. They redline something that's not okay with you, explain why. Have the conversation. It's much faster that way. So what to do, right? You go to this conference, it's all great. I'm gonna go home and I say, I went to the student data privacy thing and I learned a lot about the laws and great. But what do you do? What do you do when you go home? Look at your current policies, practices, benchmark them against the laws. Benchmark them against your community norms. Mm -hmm. Do you have policies and practices for everything? Do you have policies but no procedures? Because a policy is just words on a page unless there's a procedure that tells people how they're supposed to comply. A policy says we should not give out data to anyone who does not need data. Great, good idea. <coughs> a procedure says if you want access to data, here's who you need to request that from, here's how they approve it, here are the roles that get access to data, here's how it happens. And here's how you need to transfer it so that it stays secure. And by the way, here's how we enforce the policy, here's who you go to, to ask questions about the policy, and here's how we measure whether or not the policy is being complied with. That all needs to be part of it in order for it to make any sense and actually come to life for you. Do a data inventory. Um, make a list. This is one of the, <coughs> I feel like it's, it's one of the easiest things to do, but it's, it's long and can be arduous. But make a list of all the data fields that you collect. Names, email addresses, on and on. What are you doing with them? Um, who, how, classify them into buckets. Three buckets, maybe four. Low sensitivity, medium sensitivity, high sensitivity. Low sensitivity, data that if there's a request for it, we can release it. Not a problem. Right, your directory information should be in that bucket. High sensitivity. I don't think that we're going to give this to anybody. I think the administrators get access to this, and that's it. Right? That's your social security numbers. It's parent financial information. High sensitivity. Maybe you won't give that to vendors. How should that be protected? Is it in systems where it's protected according to how it should be based on the sensitivity? This is how you start to break it down. From those buckets, you can answer every question. How should it be protected? Okay, great, we've agreed. High sensitive data should be protected in accordance with these requirements. Now, where is our high sensitive data? Is it protected in accordance with those requirements? Yes, no, there's your gap. Right? That's what you need to work on fixing. The hardest bucket to flush out is the medium sensitivity bucket. Because right? it's kind of like, eh, sometimes it's sensitive, sometimes it's not sensitive. It might be sensitive in combination. Um, but your buckets don't need to be static. You can put something in place and then decide a few weeks later, a few months later, mm, that's not really working there. But do that as an exercise. See where your data, who's got access to the high sensitive data? Is it what you expected? If not, your next job is to start revoking permissions. And that's about as fun as getting your superintendent to do two-factor authentication. Yes. Yeah, I think the, the message of, of um, act like you're in control of your your information because you are is an important one and the place where 
uh, and again, I'm going back to the security, uh, heightened security that we all have, physical security on the buildings, is that relationship you have with your law enforcement. That's right. SROs on campus. Uh, it's the, the, uh, the perceived power imbalance when you're talking to police officers who want access to your student information system is, it seems immense. It's not. It, it's, it's actually, it's not. And there are rules around under what circumstances can right. SRO have access to this data and what can they do with that data the half hour after they leave your campus and they're no longer an SRO and now they're a police officer. And I have, I have yet to work with a, with a police officer who isn't appreciative of getting the training that they're required to have before they can have access yes. to this and having their, their, the restrictions put in place. But it's that power imbalance between your superintendent and that chief of police who will put pressure on you, but they actually don't have a leg to stand on. That's right. But you are in control of that. I think yes. you, need to, you need to put restrictions in. That's right. And it's the same power imbalance that many school systems feel when they're working with a vendor. Like, yeah. oh, they're a vendor, they're a fancy company, they probably got big lawyers. No, they don't. No, they don't. That vendor could be three people in a room making an app. It could be, yeah, they're a big company and everyone is doing eight jobs just like you are. And they don't know how you operate and they don't know your laws. The point is to have the conversations so that you can meet in the middle and do something mutually beneficial. And that you do have the control and it doesn't need to be an us versus them mentality. It means reach out, do some training. Vendors can do a lot of help for you in helping you understand, well, what is reasonable security? How are you handling this kind of technical infrastructure question? There's nothing wrong with learning from each other. You certainly learn very quickly who are your trusted vendors and who are not. Like, who's gonna help you? Who's gonna sit down in the trenches with you and go through some training with you? That's the vendor to keep. Not the one who's like, yeah, I don't know, you know, this is just a liability clause and you have to sign it, okay? Not so helpful. But I think there's also a lot of common denominator if you wanna push back. Well, ABC School District did it, well, why don't you yeah. do it with the data? No, not so fast. ABC School District doesn't necessarily understand the laws any better than 123 School District, right? There's a lot of, there's a reason why we're all here. These laws are hard, these laws are complicated. Doesn't mean that, great, that they did it. Not legal, not legal, not okay. Let's talk about something else, right? Let's come on, vendor. Let's move it along. I don't care. I, you know, I feel like I'm channeling my mother. If everyone jumped off the bridge, would you do it too, right? <laughs> Not okay. <laughs> Not okay. Um, right? So we've all had that experience where we feel like we're not, we're sort of back on our heels a little bit. The point is not to be overpowering. The point is not for any party to be overpowering. The point is to say, let's sit to get down together and figure this out. Your state laws, no one knows how to interpret them. <coughs> but your lawyer has an interpretation, a vendor has a way they need to implement, there's common ground in there somewhere. And it can be found without getting into an us versus them challenge or without <coughs> feeling like you're disempowered. You cannot fix all the risks at once. So triage. What is the risk that is, has the most severe repercussions and is most likely to happen? That's the one to start with first. Yes. I was wondering, um, in, in looking at these vendors, and if some of them look a little bit questionable, and maybe you're, you're, you're going to say no to one vendor, how many people have their own district contracts that they have a vendor sign to say, oh, OK, if you don't have it in your privacy policy, here's ours, you sign this. Can we write it in such a way that it covers us? Absolutely. As a district, well, sure we could. Uh, hopefully we are. Um, but how many people do that? Do it varies. Them? It varies. I think more and more districts are putting together a data protection addendum to add to a contract because it basically says, regardless of what's in the contract, this is how we need you to protect the data. What's really important to remember when doing that is that, A, you should have that. You should have that handy. But B, Everything gets negotiated. The, the, one of the things I see often is districts coming to vendors and saying, here, you have to sign it. You can't redline it. Well, OK, but it says I have to you know, encrypt health data, and I'm not collecting any health data. So it's a little bit weird for me to agree to something that's not applicable. And I'm not sure what that means for me legally. So I'd like to just say that's not applicable, and we're all you're not going to send me health data. Um, you have to be able to do that if you want to um, if you want to right? there's a there's a challenge 
was saying to one party, and it's the same challenge for a vendor, saying to you, here's our terms, just sign it, that's all you get. Okay? That's not a good position to be in. So the more you are fluent in what does that data protection agenda mean and where are my boundaries of negotiation, there would be some things you cannot negotiate, and that's okay. But there's probably something in there where you can be flexible, and depending on context, when privacy is contextual, you may be okay being flexible. The question is, are you whether you decide to do that or not, are you empowered enough to do it? Right? Do you know enough to do it? <coughs> then you can decide. Question in the back of the mouth. One of the most successful areas where the Yes. Most of the vendors have been happy to sign an addendum that they actually call back to when they're in talks with someone. So the, the, for, for anyone who couldn't hear, the point was that one of the most successful places in uh, getting vendors to sign on to uh, an addendum is where it essentially gives you some, some rights around your data if the vendor is sold or they go out of business uh, when that clause is missing from the vendor contract, as sometimes it is. Yeah, absolutely. Alan? Yeah, I'm um, just going to tell Jennifer and everybody else, plug the session this afternoon, the addendum you're talking about, we built one for Washington and Oregon in uh, consultation with a, a lawyer from California, Mark Williams, that is uh, an addendum for you to send out to vendors and say, your agreement's awesome, we're going to do this one on top of the yep. thing. So look at that addendum. Does it work for you? Are there things you need to adjust for your school system? There's no one size fits all. But certainly, many districts have templates, so you, you're, not, you're not inventing the wheel here. Right? Take agreements from others, put them together, put something in front of your lawyer and say, we think this works, are you okay with it? If they say yes, great, you've got your data protection addendum. So there's a lot that we can learn from others. You cop I, I refer to it as taking inspiration from a contract that someone else has already written or a privacy policy that someone else has already written. You don't have to copy it full you know, verbatim. But there's probably a lot in it. You may. You may look at it and say, perfect, this works for us. The point is that whether it's a standard agreement, whether it's a state contract, whether it's your data protection addendum, they do get negotiated. They do ne get negotiated. Whether it's a whole bunch of you saying, this is it, and you've got to sign it or not, they're getting negotiated in the background. So if you don't understand it, it's as helpful as not having one at all. Right? Know what it is that you're protecting. Know where you're about, and maybe you're going to say, "We understand it full well, and we're not going to negotiate it." But that's a choice, not a position you're backed into. And so there's a very different attitude around that when it comes to control. <coughs> We've talked about reasonable security, but this is kind of what it looks like, right? Your most sensitive data is protected layer upon layer upon layer of access control. Everyone hates writing policies. Except me, I write them for a living, so it's, I won't say it's fun, but um, just a weird skill set. Um, the hardest part I find for school systems uh, and companies, frankly, is just putting pen to paper. So here are a few things to get you started. You know you need a policy in a certain area. Right? Maybe it's data access, maybe it's what you're going to give to vendors, maybe it's your vetting process. Start by just titling the policy. Give it a title, give it a number, give me a sentence about what the purpose of the policy is, tell me who owns the policy, give me a sense of the scope of the policy. If you get those frameworks down, then the policy, you know, you put pen to paper and you'll be amazed at how the rest of it kind of comes, comes through for you. But the hardest part is often just starting. But make sure you're looking across your entire ecosystem. And the big one, how do we vet the technology our teachers are bringing into the classroom? How do we stop that from happening? Um, challenging, right? Teachers are bringing hundreds and thousands of apps into districts every day, and they're not being vetted. And they're putting your security at risk, and they're putting the privacy of your students at risk. And often they do not know that by clicking a button to agree, they're signing a contract. And they're binding you as a district to a contract, and they may not have the authority to do that. So it's a governance problem for a lot of schools. I often start with a couple of simple things um, because 
I hear from districts time and again, if I require that they stop, if I require that they vet this technology, they're going to revolt. Like they're just not going to do it because it's hard and they feel like I'm disrupting innovation. Not allowing you to, bringing an app into the classroom is not innovation. How you use it is innovative. So I do a few things. One, we need to train our teachers on this stuff. They don't know why we have these pesky rules in place. And they need to understand they're part of the chain that protects the data of the student, or part of the chain that protects that student. Two, you're signing a contract when you click that button, and that is legally binding, and you're not authorized to do it. Three, you don't bring a book into the classroom without reading it, writing up a lesson plan, and making some worksheets. An app is no different. Why do we think we can bring technology in just because it's shiny and new without actually looking at it? There's not a book in your school system library that someone has not read and said, yes, this should be in our library. Why do we think it's different for technology? It's just a new book, right? Let's start thinking about it that way. And then one more thing. Hey, the teachers, I'm not going to, I'm not going to stop you from bringing things into the classroom. Just not. We're going to build up a vetting program, but it's going to take us a while to build up a library of apps and websites that we think are OK. So in the meantime, all I want you to do is I want you to get the privacy policy and the terms of use. I want you to copy and paste them into a Word document. I want you to print them out, sign it, date it, and just send it to me in the office. People hate signing things. People hate, hate putting their name on things. It feels like a contract, because it is. And not all, some of your teachers will be like, fine, I'm going to put my name on it. I don't care. But some won't. And those are the ones, right? That's where the gold is. Right? Those are your first movers who are starting to get it and make the connection. And they're going to be the teachers who will do it, but are also going to email you and say, so I, here's the privacy policy. Is, is it OK? <laughs> the point is, have they read it? For some districts, I've done this, and we actually put up, put together a list of five questions. Right? You have to answer these yes/no questions. Right? Is there a clause in the contract that says, you know, the, when you'll delete the data? Is there? Does it say how they're going to handle COPPA? Does it say this? Does it say that? Does it say we're in control? Um, you pick the five questions. Yes/no. Make it really easy. We're not asking for a lot of work here. This is not an essay they have to write. Answer these five questions and then sign it and send it to me. So you're forcing them to look. You're forcing them to pause all this is about. It's, it's an evolution. Right? We cannot rip off the band-aid and not expect the pain and suffering that comes with it. We can start to slowly peel the band-aid off. Right? It's going to hurt, it's just, you know, not all at once and not so shockingly. As that's going on, you are looking, you did a survey of your teachers, a no questions asked survey, an anonymous survey that says, I want a list of all the apps and websites being used in the classroom. And you took that list and you put it together and you said, what are my most popular websites and apps? Those are the ones I'm going to vet first. And you put them on a portal, you put them on a website, send out a document that says, these are good, these are good. And every month you're going to commit to, I don't know, vetting two more, three more. You keep feeding that list, feeding that list. Because eventually you get to a point where the pain of signing this agreement and checking those boxes and the discomfort is sort of outweighed by the fact that there's this, there's this box of tools here that I can use and I don't have to sign anything and I don't have to deal with putting my name to something. And that's when you say, okay, teachers, now everything goes through the vetting process. Right? So evolution. If you, if you can rip off the Band-Aid, by all means do it. Right? If you can say to teachers, full stop, tomorrow, nothing gets into the classroom without being vetted, do it, absolutely. If you can't, get into it gradually. This has to come with education and training. As with law enforcement, as with our athletic coaches, we're not training teachers on data privacy and they handle it every day. They have no idea why we care. They have no idea why these rules are in place or why it's important. Because we don't tell them. <coughs> so, <coughs> uh, perils and pitfalls. Check the box of privacy. This is complicated stuff. You can't just be like one and done. Yeah, we wrote the policy, so it's good. This is, a this is building a living, breathing function in your organization, and we need to respect that. Uh, someone has to be in charge, but 
privacy is something that flows across an organization. Everyone has a role to play and everyone should understand that and be invested in it. Privacy is top down, bottom up. By that I mean your leadership needs to champion it. But then you've got to build the policies and procedures with the people who are going to be affected by them. There's nothing worse than your boss handing you a policy and say, here are the new rules, and you had no idea it was coming, and it didn't take it all into consideration the way you do your job. It happens time and time again. What if you have some representative at the table when you're writing policy? And listen, between us friends, the policy may end up being exactly what you wanted it to be in the first place. But people need to be heard. And when you can give them a win on how a policy looks or rolls out or what it requires, do that. Because if I believe the policy, if I believe I wrote the policy, I will follow it. If I believe it was handed down to me by my boss and I have no idea why, compliance drops. Compliance drops. Um, laws are not your policy. Laws are the laws. Your policy and your procedures are what is the behavior we need to engage in in order to comply with the laws. The law says don't give out personal information without parental consent. Great. That's not a policy. That's not a, that's not a procedure. What is it that I have to do? Well, you have to go to the administrator when you're going to release data for this purpose. Here's the form to fill out. Here's what you do. Because I don't know how to behave in the way that you expect if you have not documented that. No one's going to read, okay, some of us friends are going to read FERPA. But your teachers aren't going to read FERPA. You can't give them that as a policy and say, just do this. When the office, when the privacy office of the U.S. Department of Education says there are places in FARPA that we're not quite clear on, we can't give that as a policy. We can say, what do we expect as behavior? Uh, and then a couple of, um, like one specific one, disaster response and, um, and instant response. This is one that I, that I see most commonly confused, and I can describe it best this way. Disaster is when a meteor hits your server. An incident is when a student hacks into your system. An incident may turn out to be a disaster, but there are two completely different policies and procedures. Completely different policies and procedures, and they need to be treated as such. Disaster response, your testing, system recovery, annual basis, what happens when the server goes down, who gets called, how do we put it back together, what's our backup system, have we tested it, does that work? Great. Incident. There's this funny email that came in and someone clicked on it. Who knows who gets to investigate? How do we investigate? Who gets to communicate about it? Who does not get to communicate about it? Do they know not to communicate about it? That's how you run an incident. I had a, another parallel and pitfall that I think we see with the, with the Facebook issues that are, that are coming up that we see in, in school districts also is the expediency um, conundrum we have. Those those uh, little authenticate via Microsoft or authenticate via a fake Google um, account information. I mean, those are, that's a terrible strategy. Um, almost never does the vendor tell you what data am I grabbing from Microsoft or Facebook or Google <coughs> about this kid. It just says, give me access to this kid's entire profile. Trust me that I'll only take what I need and that I'll only do good things with it. Mm -hmm. And then the, just move forward. And it's, it, it's so easy, and I don't know how to stop <coughs> people from, click, from telling kids from, click on that box because yeah. it works like that. Because it has to be in that vendor's privacy policy, right? What they're getting when they do, and, and it I've never is. I've never seen one vendor who's actually is, right? told me yeah. what, what to get out yeah. of. And that's only because I said, I'm not signing this contract if you tell me what you So really, really important point, very important with vendors. When you're working with vendors, what information are they getting? Understand what third parties they have operating in their product and how they are managing the compliance of those third parties. The Colorado law actually requires this. Um, and, and there's another state that requires it as well. Uh, and I'm forgetting which one. But essentially, and by the way, it's required of COPPA. For vendors under COPPA, when they engage with third parties, those vendors need to do diligence on those third parties to make sure they can and do comply with COPPA. Right? So a vendor who brings a third party into their product and that vendor uses data in a way that's not compliant with COPPA, the vendor's strict liability unless that third party knew they were in a 
kids' product, in which case they have some shared, shared liability. So we need to ask the same thing. And listen, I understand. It is hard enough to know kind of what the vendor's doing, let alone what their third party is doing. But they should be able to answer that question. And if they can't, then they're not good enough. They're not good enough. If they don't have a privacy policy, don't bother. If they don't have a fundamental understanding of their requirements, don't even bother. Don't even talk, just drop it. If they cannot give you information about their third parties, why not? You put the parties in there. If you don't know, who does? They should be able to tell you. It may not be outlined in their privacy policy, but they should be able to tell you. And if they give you a hard time about asking, you think about, well, what kind of customer support am I going to be getting from you when your system goes down? Right. So this is your cycle. Right? This is unfortunately not a one and done situation. Right? Keep going. Keep going. Compliance is a muscle that has to be exercised constantly. And you build on it. Little victories lead to bigger victories. You know, one school system spent one year, their goal for one year, Implement complex passwords. That was it. That was their compliance goal. And they did it. They spent the entire year going through the pain of that. But they did it. And those little things build momentum. You cannot do this all at once. Don't expect to do it all at once. The point is to continuously make some progress. Because you get better every time. What you don't want to have happen is you do a gap assessment. And then you come back the next year and you realize you've got the same problems. So you do your assessment. You do training. You implement new policies and procedures. You have some accountability around those policies and procedures. And then the next year, you realize, oh, that problem, we solved that problem. We no longer have a gap there. We still have a whole bunch of other gaps, but that one seems to be holding steady. That's the idea. <clears throat> I talked about this before, your privacy policy. I mean, if you do something when you go back home, look and see if your website has a privacy policy. If it doesn't, why not? What third parties are in your website? Do you know? <coughs> are you disclosing them in your privacy policy? I appreciate that this is not the first, but writing your website privacy policy on a scale of you know one to 10,000 of privacy and security issues you have, this is like somewhere around 20,000, right? This is not a high priority. But it's a way to start flexing your muscle around understanding how the data ecosystem works that you will be able to apply to every vendor you work with. Every vendor. If you can understand your website privacy policy, how third parties operate in your privacy, in your website, the tracking that happens there, that's, that's, what, that's what vendors are doing too. So at least, if nothing else, use your own website as your, as your fishbowl, right? as your testing ecosystem. Like, what are we doing? Does anyone know? What third parties do we have operating? I don't know. <coughs> it happens all the time. I get that it's not a priority. You have a significant volume of priorities. But this is important, and so use it as your, as your test environment. Use it as a place to learn. Jeanette? Yeah. I just want to mention we've gone through receiving um, letters from the Office of Civil Rights in relation to uh -huh. ADA compliance, which then led to our, our third party vendors ADA compliance, such as our nutrition service lunch menu, um, transportation and stuff. But I hadn't thought about looking at their privacy policies at the same time. So since we're already on this boat since with you're already else, on, might as well yeah. you know, add to the pile. And yes, ADA compliance <coughs> is spreading like wildfire. There's actually a new uh, publication that's coming out, um, Accessibility, Compliance, and Equity, um, that's going to be focused on on those three things. Um, I think it's coming out in June, so that might be an interesting one to watch. But very common that school systems are starting to get letters, um, OCR requests. There are a couple of districts, uh, big districts on both coasts that are under um, under settlements. The other thing is they just also then sent us a letter five months later saying, "Oh, we're pulling back from this, and you don't, we don't have enough staff <laughs> to monitor <laughs> this." Yeah. So. Just move forward. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for getting scared. We're going to, yes. Um, but, it's, but it's coming, and you'll see it more and more. Um, and we know of some big districts that are under settlement, OCR settlements, um, and they, they cannot 
contract with a vendor that's not compliant in that regard. So while you're looking at those policies, you can look at them for a lot of things. And when you're asking those questions, why not tackle, tackle everything at once? Um, put your vendors on notice. So there's a lot here, right? <coughs> and one of the keys to this is your parents and your community members and how are they responding to you? We talk a little bit about data breaches. It's not if, it's when. How are you prepared to handle it? Have you built any trust in your community before something goes wrong? Because there's nothing worse than having an incident or any sort of situation around data. It's gonna upset your community and you've not yet established some level of trust and credibility with your community so that they're gonna look at you and say, I'm not happy, but I appreciate that that's an aberration and that's not how you normally operate. You've gotta build up that trust bank, have to. And that is done through communication. So when you do all this work and you dust everything off and you find your gaps and you build your policies and procedures, how are you also talking to your community about the fact that you're engaging in this work and you are being responsible and you're making best efforts and you're doing things like this. You're coming to conferences and sitting in a cold room and learning, right? We're all cold, right? <laughs> this is important stuff for your community to be aware of, that you are making that effort. So how do we talk to our community about that in a way that doesn't overpromise and say, we're perfect, everything's fine, but says, we're taking reasonable steps. If any of you are free this afternoon, I'm doing a session on the Coast and Trusted Learning Environment, which is focused on just that, focused on getting yourselves ready, some measurable criteria against which to assess yourself, and then communication tools for your community to build that trust. Because we are, by nature, we tend to be very forgiving if someone says, I'm sorry. We're not entirely forgiving if we didn't believe you were doing anything okay in the first place. And so that's what we wanna to get to, unpack all this stuff, put some simple things in place. If there's one thing that you can take from this when you go back home, whether it's check your website privacy policy and see if you can understand it or get it written if it's not there, or make a list of the data that you have and start to put it into buckets, high, medium, and low sensitivity, that's a win. These little things build momentum and they'll get you there. This stuff gets easier over time, I promise. The first time you do it, it's going to be hard. After you get through that, you get into a groove and it gets a lot easier. Any questions? No? You're just cold and... <laughs> yeah? Do you ever communicate with teacher prep programs especially young Uh, yes and no, right? One of the things we're not doing a great job at is educating teachers. Um, and <laughs> there are a few things that we can do around professional development. Um, you know, I'll put in a plug for COSIN. We've got an online, you know, I feel like I'm just plugging myself. We have an online facilitated training course to eight weeks. I'm your facilitator. Um, there is a self-directed version of it. Department of Education, studentprivacy.gov edu.gov has got some videos, some other modules. Um, my second book is gonna is is teachers teacher training around this. There's nothing in the college no, there's nothing. There's nothing in the in the prep, in the existing programs. Right? It's a it's a gap. It's a gap. I'll work on that. Any other questions? Thank you all very much. Hope to see you this afternoon. Thank you. Without missing it.